Good afternoon. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kata. That's a formal Māori greeting to everyone in the room. Thank you very much for coming along today. I really do appreciate it. First of all, I'd like to thank the Rachel Carson Centre for the tremendous privilege and honour of the fellowship and to thank all the staff who've been so fantastic. I want to thank my fellow fellows, such a, a wonderful group of people, and all the other researchers and the postgraduate students for cultivating such a stimulating and, and supportive um, intellectual environment. And they have already provided invaluable feedback to me on my research. Now, in the short time that I've got today, I want to talk to you about positive emotions and sustainability. And I'm going to focus on everyday sustainability. And obviously, I only have time to give you a quick overview of the research I've been doing here at the ICC. And the work that I've been doing is kind of providing, working out the theoretical framework of a broader project that will continue into next year um, that will involve some case studies. So I'd like to start today with a few possible scenarios of everyday sustainability. If I can get the thing to work, that's right, okay. It may be that you have a small vegetable garden at home and you get out in the morning cool to harvest some produce for that evening's dinner. Or it may be that you've worked hard for your housing co-op to organize for the establishment of some solar cells on your building's roof. And today you are able to turn on the hot water for the first time using that energy source. Or it may be that you're part of a local environmental group and you're spending a Saturday morning planting out a denuded hillside with others as part of a project to regenerate local bushland and encourage the return of native fauna. In each of these scenarios, and I'm sure we can all imagine many, many more, people engage in practices of everyday sustainability because they're concerned about the climate crisis, they're concerned about the state of the environment, they feel obligated to help to do something in their own lives. Equally, however, they do so because it makes them feel good, it gives them pleasure, it evokes positive emotions. And so today I want to try to think through the significance of those positive emotions. There are two sections to my talk today. Firstly, I want to talk to you about the relationship generally between emotions and the environment, noting how emotions are bodily phenomena and linking them to a specific experiential and engaged account of the self. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, about specific positive emotions and indicate, indicate how they're integral to sustainability. Ultimately, I believe positive emotions are not just a pleasant ancillary feature to the important task of sustainability. Instead, I argue they're fundamental necessary phenomena that arise from our material engagements with our environments and that if we are to move towards greater levels of sustainability, we need to be aware of and must cultivate these positive emotions. So, Let's talk, first of all, about emotions and the environment. It's evident today, as we grapple with the extraordinary changes that are required with the climate crisis, that there's an emotional connection between ourselves and our environments. And of course, for a long time, the problem has been that we've been insufficiently emotional about the end of the world as we know it. But now, you can argue that climate change is increasingly giving rise to strong emotions, ranging from feelings of hopeless despair and existential dread in response to the melting of the ice caps and apocalyptic wildfires, through to oops, through to the hope and excitement when students and children from around the world take to the streets in protest. Now, as I hope that all of us can readily appreciate, emotions are fundamentally bodily phenomena. Emotions are sometimes distinguished between primary or basic emotions such as fear, anger and joy that are said to be hardwired in the body, universal, linked to basic survival and evolutionary processes from which are subsequently derived a greater range of more complex secondary emotions which learn from experience. The foundational significance of the body in emotions is captured in the work of the 19th century psychologist William James who inverted the commonly held views that emotions preceded physical sensation, arguing instead that it was bodily sensation and change in response to an event that subsequently gave rise to emotions. So, we are afraid 
because we tremble, or we feel grief because we cry. As such, quoting Marinelli, emotion marks the sensory experience of a physiological transformation accompanied by a mental state. Now, the embodied nature of emotions helps us to consider more specifically the character of the emotional engagements with nature and the environment, and the kind of self that arises through these interactions with our surrounding world and with each other. I understand the sustainable self as deriving from an engaged and experiential relationship with and perception of that individual's environment. The anthropological work of Ingold and Milton helps us to understand the preeminent importance of our grounding in the world, the ways we act in our physical environments, and the ways we pick up information from encounters with the material environment and other humans. This perception of our environments is a fully embodied, sentient perception, not limited to the processing of information by the mind. This form of direct perception challenges conventional understandings that we act in the environment only after we've received and processed sensory data. And instead, it focuses on the practical forms of knowledge that arise from our ongoing actions and simultaneously accompanying perceptions of our environmental context. It's from this situatedness that we learn to read environments, ascertaining over time regularities and the affordances that are offered by the environment. So this account rejects understandings that posit humans as a priori discrete entities that encounter environments. That is, the personhood of humans is not a given ontological state, but rather it's an experiential process that arises through the ways we relate to human and non-human entities in our environments and the ways that they relate to us. Now, you might be well be sitting there thinking at this stage, oh, okay, um, but the world is a little bit more complex than these elemental empirical encounters with our immediate environments that I've just been describing. And you would be right. This approach does not deny the subsequent complex cultural constructivism that occurs through the way that humans cognitively process, discursively represent their environments, formulate understandings of identity, and generally engage in processes of abstraction and disengagement that yield knowledge of themselves and their world. The point is, however, that we've not sufficiently acknowledged or understood how the originally status of the personhood of humans is fundamentally an experiential pro uh, relationship that arises from our involvements and actions in our environments. If this idea had a rallying cry, it would not be back to nature, but start from nature, or more specifically, start from our environments. And these environments range from those where the natural world dominates to those human-dominated, often urban environments that most of us inhabit most of the time. Now, our understandings of emotions generally and emotions linked to sustainable living, more specifically, are linked to and grow out of this account of self-formation. Emotions are foundational, necessary expressions of our responses to our experiential engagement with our environments that facilitate our senses of self. Now, building on the comments I've just made about how emotions arise from bodily change, we can argue that emotions are not internalized phenomena, privately owned and independent, but rather they're profoundly grounded, arising from our relational orientation to our environment. And I argue that we must locate sustainability within such contexts, seeing it initially and importantly as existential and emotional orientations to our environments manifested through our physical context with those non-human and human surrounds. Emotions are then fundamentally environmental. Emotions are mechanisms that arise from, direct and express our physical relations with our environments and contribute to subsequent assignations of value and meaning and any attempt to understand and mobilize positive emotions in sustainable living must be based partly upon such a conceptualization. Right, so let's now talk about specific positive emotions in sustainability. Now, firstly, let me say that I acknowledge that the concept of sustainability carries complex resonances and it's a highly contested term and I'm not going to talk about it now because I'm not done at the time and if you want to ask questions about that later on, you can. Um, 
I'm using sustainability here today in the context of everyday sustainability in a way that foregrounds its positive ideal status. Sustainability ideally gives expression to not only the ongoing viability of the complex relationship between the environment and human activity, but it also speaks to an idea about the quality of life, not only for us now, but for those who follow us. As such, sustainability participates in the broader philosophical project of the construction of the good life, expressing positive emotions and pleasure, but also in this particular instance, also invoking no no notions of moderation and simplicity as well. I want to unpack the positive emotions of everyday sustainability today through a mode of classification that you can see here, talking about sensory or materially based emotions and then also talking about emotions that are, are more primarily defined through an idea of temporality. So we're talking about interest, excitement, and enjoyment, joy. And you can see that those two primary positive emotions come from Tompkins' famous list of primary emotions. And the reason why those two terms are, are coupled together is that Tompkins makes the argument that the second term is the more intense manif manifestation of that emotion. So interest builds into excitement. Enjoyment builds into uh, joy. And then I also want to talk about the concept of happiness. And then with the temporary, temporally based emotions, I want to talk about hope and confidence. And I, I ha I'm, I'm quick to suggest that this list of positive emotions and this mode of, of uh, categorization is, of course, highly selective. It's merely suggestive. And the, also the two categories have a primarily heuristic value. And there's and in reality, there's a complex, mutually informing relationship between these two categories that I'll, I'll allude to in a minute. So let's talk about the materially based emotions. The practices of everyday sustainability highlight the subjective, qualitative, and sensory character of sustainability. It's tangible textures, smells, looks, and tastes. It's these sensory experiences that are fundamental to the production of positive emotions attached to everyday sustainability. Such sensory contacts and experiences are constituted through the complexity of direct sensory moments. The eating of a peach, for example, that evokes comprehensions of taste, texture, and smell, melded with knowledge of the material conditions and the work that has yielded such produce. And they also extend more broadly to a sensory appreciation of the skills and practices that enable sustainable living, such as learning how to prune a fruit tree properly, or being able to repair furniture. So let's talk about interest and excitement. Some have argued that interest is more of a cognitive state than an emotion, but others have underlined the importance of interest and the burgeoning process of excitement, not only as a fundamental emotion, but fundamental to all emotion formation. Izzard writes, interest is the feeling of being engaged, caught up, fascinated, curious. There's a feeling of wanting to investigate, to become involved. And Tompkins himself goes so far as to argue that interest excitement preempts even the more elemental human drive system. Every, excitement in everyday sustainability arises out of the process of direct perception that I've already talked about. Such emotions of excitement, seeing the first broad bean of the season break through the soil, for example, not only has material basis, but the excitement arises from recognition of a change in temporality, the unfolding of growth and maturation. So there you can see the way in which the sensory and the temporal come together. Moving on to enjoyment joy. Enjoyment and its stronger manifestation of joy shares a complex relationship with interest excitement. Our enjoyment builds on the initial engagement of interest and, ex and excitement with the comprehension of satisfaction and pleasantness about the experience that the self is encountering. In this way, our feelings of enjoyment are also related to self-perception. To experience or practice is to evaluate, um, to enjoy an experience or practice is to evaluate positively the ability of the self to manage and engage with the experience and to evaluate accompanying and or subsequent rewards and benefits. Now, it's been interesting that there's been, I have, not been able to find much research about the specific relationship between sustainability and enjoyment. And I think that that lacunae is, is in itself significant. But I argue that everyday sustainability will only be cultivated if we facilitate its enjoyment and joy, grounding it in mundane practices and yet also connecting such quotidian emotions with the broader context of sustainability, captured in a sense of the enchantment of the world 
and associated notions of wonder and biophilia. Let's move on now to happiness. Always a good topic to talk about. Happiness takes us beyond the purview of individual emotions to more of an emotional state that, be, that can be constituted by a range of emotions. And when considered with regard to sustainability, it more explicitly links with notions of the good life. Now, unlike some of the other research that I've been, just been suggesting, um, there's been a lot of research about, the relationship, about happiness as a concept and the relationship between happiness and sustainability. And I'm sure that we're all well, we're all well aware of those policy and political contexts that attempt to kind of uh, locate um, happiness in politically and, and, and socially. Um, we probably all know about Bhutan's well-known promotion of gross national happiness index in contrast to the conventional gross domestic product. There's the Happy Planet Index. There's the Ecological Wellbeing Performance Study that measures and contrasts the ecological ability of nation states around the world. And of course, I am happy that New Zealand has just released its annual national budget that is framed around the concept of individual, community, and national well-being in contrast to economic performance. Now, the, the quantity and breadth of research on the subject of happiness and the associated work formulating models and frameworks of sustainable happiness, important and valuable as they undoubtedly are, can I suggest sometimes have the effect of taking us away from understanding the particular kind of happiness that is produced in everyday sustainability. There are two dominant perceived types of happiness. The hedonic or more hedonistic type of happiness and well-being, which refers to the positive effects that accompany getting or having material objects and action opportunities one wishes to possess and to experience. And the eudaimonia view of happiness that might be to, seen to as a more idealistic understanding about happiness, which maintains that happiness and well-being is a process of fulfilling or realizing one's true nature that is, of fulfilling one's virtuous potentials and living as one was inherently intended to live. Now, I think that part of the problem of understanding happiness in everyday sustainability is that it actually partakes in the hedonic type of happiness, which foregrounds the material and subjective base of, basis of happiness. But of course, the, this hedonistic view of happiness is also commonly negatively associated for us with the material context of modern consumer capitalism. Alternatively, the kind of happiness that's traditionally associated with sustainability derives more from the concept of eudaimonia, which foregrounds the positive emotions linked with processes of self-realization that incorporate understandings of one's relationship with others, the environment, and the world at large. Now, while acknowledging that these positions are not mutually exclusive, I suggest that part of the task here is to articulate the value of the materially grounded and sensory nature of positive emotions of everyday sustainability without necessarily legitimating them through reference to a higher level of happiness, however uh, legitimate that linkage might well be. What we need to do, I suggest, is to envisage, envisage and enact a form of what we might term alternative hedonism, to use Kate Soper's term, which represents, quote, a new erotics of consumption or hedonistic imaginary. Such an alternative hedonism arises when individuals engage in acts of everyday sustainability, not only because they feel a moral obligation or a sense of higher responsibility, but also because there are positive emotions and sensual pleasures associated with the acts of everyday sustainability. So, riding a bike to work instead of driving a car, for example, should be motivated not only by the concerns to reduce one's own carbon emissions, but also by the sheer physical pleasure and positive emotions that flow from such exertions. Then very briefly, finally today, I want to talk about temporality um, and hope and confidence. Sustainability is, of course, a concept that is profoundly informed by temporality, bringing together the contemporary moment with regard to the ongoing viability of the future, but also an understanding of the legacy of the past. I suggest there's simply an emotional pleasure in much everyday sustainability work that stems from the projected benefits of that sustainability work. The pleasure of everyday sustainable living is informed by and engenders a sense of hope. I contend that the emotion of hope is an integral feature of everyday sustainability and the broader global project of sustainability. Hope can be excluded as a prototypical emotion 
in that it does not have a direct biological basis, but such contemporary psychological classifications overlook the long historical recognition of hope as a fundamental human emotion. Hope is fundamental to sustainability precisely because it enables the temporal order that constitutes sustainability. Hope compels us into the future. It animates beliefs of potentiality that motivate the becoming of ourselves and our environments. Hope may not have a direct physiological basis, but it sustains us through to the physical realities of a desired future. Now, the importance of hope has been recently articulated by our very own Christoph Mahl, who argues more particularly for the value of a slow hope that recognises the necessary long arc of our cumulative responses to climate change and which carries with it a resilience born of our encounters with setbacks. Christoph argues that narratives of ongoing and inspiring acts of sustainability around the world can, quote, guide us away from past dependencies and traps and into understandings that imagine a different, a more just, and more ecological world. And then finally, confidence. Confidence can be placed in oneself, in others, in future events. Confidence is linked with faith and trust, although confidence requires more evidence, and it also has a corresponding lower level of feeling. Confidence may be understood through its orientation of a future desired object or state, but its cognitive basis is focused on an individual's self-knowledge. Confidence is thus not only an important emotion in its own right, but more extensively it's crucial in human agency. And Barbelay argues that confidence underlines all action as its effective basis, given the temporal indeterminacy of all actions. Confidence, however, is not a solitary individual emotion, but like all emo emotions, it can have the effect of contagion and be the basis for social relationships like the kind of camaraderie that can be enjoyed in collective sustainability work. Confidence often arises from local, everyday acts of sustainability, where the locus of sustainability is circumscribed and progress towards greater sustainability can be observed and experienced over time. This suggests that everyday sustainability provides important emotional reservoirs for a healthy subjectivity, and the orientation of that subjectivity towards more geographically dispersed environments and temporarily distant futures. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>